Hey guys, you're watching Urban Dirt and I'm at the very first garden of the day of the Theodore Payne Native Plant Garden Tour. We're at a 1,250 square foot garden in Burbank, California. The perfect example of having limited amount of space and still incorporating natives into your landscape and thus all the wildlife. This is gonna be a great day. I can't wait to check out all these gardens. I'm delighted to be standing with Lily Singer, a woman of many titles and many hats. Hot. <laughs> Hatless right now, for our sake. Um, Lily, uh, you are the uh, tour coordinator for the Theodore Payne Native Plant Garden Tour. Correct. What, what do you expect today? How many people are we going to see? Well, um, we usually expect about 1,000 to 1,500 people walking through the gardens um, wow. on any given year. And some of the gardens are repeats from previous years. This year we have 14 new gardens. Wow. And so it's, there's always something new in new neighborhoods. And it's just the perfect weather after, uh, after storms. Absolutely, all that and, rain. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. It, and all the wildflowers are opening and the poppies are popping. And Excellent. It's just a gorgeous day. Well, it's fun to be out here. And I've, I've followed this woman for years, you guys. If you uh, want to know any information, you can contact her through the Theater Pain uh, Foundation. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of stuff going on there, of course. Thank, Thank you, Lily, for you. being Thank on you, Urban Dirt. Can I put a plug in for our classes? Yes, you certainly can. Um, Theater Pain is a nonprofit organization, and we operate a retail nursery all year long and an education center. And we have classes for adults all year long on gardening with native plants and natural history, um, entomology, really fun stuff. And then we also have wonderful programs for children, K through 12. That's so right. It's part yeah. of what we do. It, it's so. an excellent way yeah. to uh, start your endeavors into this being responsible, planting natives, and supporting wildlife. And planting gorgeous plants. Absolutely. You can have beautiful gardens and have natives. Trust me, yeah. right? Thanks, David. <laughs> You're welcome. Hey guys, I'm standing with Candy Parker, one of the homeowners of Garden Number no. 4, located in Burbank, California. Hello, Candy. Hi, how are you? Thanks for being on the show with us. I wanted you to tell us a little bit about this contraption here. What is that? Well, this is a Klamath stove. My parents do a lot of outdoor uh, restoration, so this was over at West Fork. They were scrapping all of these stoves, and uh, they were actually used by the Forest Service as uh, a griddle top, and then you could put wood inside and make an oven great outdoor grill and um, it just holds up really well in the weather. What an excellent feature. Now, you and your mom apparently put this garden together in a weekend's time, is that correct? Yes, we went up to Theodore Payne, we got two wagons full of uh, just all the different plants we wanted. It's beautiful, you guys. Um, I hope that we capture it well enough. I don't think we can, but I'm telling you, these gardens are stunning. Thank you so much, Candy, for being You're on welcome. the show. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about your climate station here, which is a very attractive feature? Sure, with all the microclimates here in, in Southern California, we're butted up against the Verdugos. We'd like to know what actual rainfall we're getting here on our particular property. So this will give us rainfall reading, it gives us wind, heat index, uh, temperature, humidity. Uh, so it's quite a bit of information. It all downloads right there in my computer inside the house and also a little uh, unit that I have in, inside the house as well. Right, this just exemplifies smart gardening techniques and if you're a techie out there, th you're probably going out of your mind that you can incorporate this with gardening. Hey guys, we're at garden number seven in Atwater Village. 6,250 square feet of natural habitat. Definitely all natural here. We're gonna take a look around. Salvia Clevelandii, 30 Dave's top pick for native plants. Hey guys, I'm standing with Michael Miller. He is the homeowner and garden designer for Garden Number no. 7 in Atwater Village. Michael, thank you for being on the show. Sure, thanks. So uh, with a mature garden, I noticed it said that you started in 1999. What is specific about this garden that uh, people should maybe try to strive for? Uh, we no longer water uh, any of the mature plants in the yard and uh, have very low maintenance, um, very little weeding uh, and pruning to do because they're all established. Garden 7 definitely has a lot going on and definitely suits my needs and Mother Nature's. And the aroma, oh my goodness, I wish this was scratch and sniff. If you could only be here. We are at garden number 17, and I'm with Kathy Sturdevent. She is the homeowner of this garden. And um, we start off with this great stream bed here. Beautiful, very natural setting. 
We've been seeing all kinds of wildlife today. Well, yes. Uh, well, it was a little cool, so we didn't get as many butterflies, but we did have a few butterflies and bees. Uh, the drive stream is actually interesting because it's actually designed to collect rainwater and allow it to absorb into the ground. The gutters for the house are all directed to the stream, and it's designed so that we won't have runoff. It'll all absorb into the ground table. That's great. And and you were saying that it attracts all kinds of wildlife. What kind of things we do you get, see? Uh, I get a lot of butterflies, a lot of bees. Uh, I get a lot of birds, especially because of the bird bath. So the birds are here for seed and also for the insects. Right. And, and you're one probably that allows everything to go to seed until the birds get it. Yeah, it can get a little messy like the dry stream to let things reseed. But these uh, reseeded from last year. Great. Well, thank you, Kathy, for sharing this oh, with us Oh, you're welcome. Today. Garden number 17 with the garden designer, Greg Rubin. Welcome to the show, Greg. Oh, thank you. I should mention that I'm actually a co-designer because the owner of this uh, property here actually had a huge part in the layout and design of this landscape as well. It was really a collaborative effort. Well, she, but she sought out excellent help, right? <laughs> well, you know, not to brag, but... Uh, <laughs> Tell me, how many gardens have you designed? Over 600. I'd say that's some expertise talking there. <laughs> <laughs> um, were there any challenges specific to this property that Kathy or you came up against? Well, you know, it, a lot of it was infrastructure, actually. She, she had to kind of pause in the process to take care of some other issues like the sewer line because you really want to deal with that. You don't want to have to tear up a beautiful garden later on to take care of that and also had to redo her porch. So um, those issues popped up during the process and need to be uh, dealt with. But as far as the actual design of the landscape, um, because she already had a pretty good idea of what she wanted, um, it literally took us about three hours sitting at her dining room table to design this whole landscape. So one of the nice things about this area here is the soil it has excellent drainage and so it can absorb a tremendous amount of water as long as you slow it down and allow it to stay on site. Excellent. I'm standing with Keith Malone, communications consultant of Theodore Payne Foundation and 11-year volunteer. Welcome to the show, Keith. Thank you, David. Now, what would you say to a newcomer to this, somebody that might be hesitant to start a native garden? Well, I like to start off by asking them a few questions, you know, um, if they're new to the tour, if they're new to natives, and then I begin to talk to them a little bit about first understanding that, or as I like to say, as a bachelor gardener, that gardening with natives is like a culture of benign neglect, that they need to kind of take what they've learned about non-natives and kind of throw it out the, the door a bit. Right. Um, that they need, to, they need to pull back a little bit. They can't be as maybe attentive to their, their plants that they need to water right. less. And when we talk about regular watering, we're maybe talking about maybe once a week, once every two weeks, maybe right. once a month. Right. So just trying to get them over to that hurdle and also talking to them about the fact that that summer is our winter in California. That's when native plants tend sure. to go to sleep a bit. That's sure. when they want to be watering less. And right. just to get them into a different kind of space. Different mentality on how to care for plants. Absolutely. Right. So when they understand that, then when you start talking to them about water regimens and other needs, they're, they, they understand it a little bit better. Right. So we get in touch with our laziness on purpose, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And as a bachelor gardener, I know my laziness. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm in garden number six in Los Feliz, California with Kathleen Ferguson. You are the garden designer of this garden. That's correct. Thank you for being on the Thank show. You. Thank you for coming. I have to ask you, um, in, in the literature it says this is a native contemporary garden. What does that mean exactly? That means we use native plant material in a more contemporary way. Um, you can see here how we've done the Dudleyas that have a more architectural form in mass planting next to the softer, fluffier um, Verbena de la Mina. So having that contrast, mass bold plantings, um, that's what we mean by doing a native contemporary garden. Excellent, because so many times people think native, they think more natural right. and flowy right. and free, right. but this is sort of in a more formal uh, contemporary right. fashion. Correct. Right. Excellent. Yes. And how old is this garden? This garden is about a year and four months. Wow, excellent. Well, we're going to take a look inside. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Premonodendron, San Gabriel, flannel bush hybrid. Why wouldn't you plant this native? It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely, without a doubt, one of my most favorite places on the tour yet. Imagine this in your own backyard, surrounded by a native cultivar of hookara and a fire pit, a meeting area. You just can't go wrong. A water feature in a garden is always an important asset, especially if it's a native garden and you want to support all the natural wildlife. Plus, it adds such a great soothing sound. In garden number nine, sitting with Cassie Aoyagi of Form LA Landscaping and president of Theodore Payne Foundation. Welcome to the show, Cassie. Thanks, David, for All right. having me. You're welcome. And we're going to get a little tour by you, right? Yes, I would love to show you this garden. All right, Cassie, so tell us about this beautiful meadow. Well, one of the trends now is that people are trying to find ways to save water, which is, should be really more than a trend. But people are actually taking their lawns out as one of the very first steps to do that. And this is a mix of Carex panza and Carex tumulacola, which are two varieties of California native sedge. And they're wonderful lawn alternatives. And what we've done here is we've let it grow long. It gets just about 8 to 12 inches long. And we've let it be natural. But you can also mow it if you want. It's great with kids and dogs. It takes no fertilizer, very little water, about 50 to 80 percent savings in water. And then just for fun, we've incorporated some beautiful native irises, some uh, blue-eyed grasses, and some wildflowers so that we get a little bit pops of color throughout the year. But it's green year-round and it's beautiful. What kind of beast do we have behind That's here? Right. Well, since this is a California native garden tour, we actually have two California native tortoises in our tortoise uh, reptile cage. And when we came here, this was um, a, still a tortoise reptile cage, but it was not properly enclosed. And now it's just beautiful. The tortoises live here and they just thrive. Behind me, you guys might notice this monstrous slope. Tell us a little bit about uh, the design challenges of working with the slope. So many of us do here in the LA area. That's right. Um, the design challenges on a slope are, <laughs> are endless, actually, because you're threatened by erosion. You're always having to pull something out to get the right thing in. And so there's an establishment period, and there's maintenance obstacles. How are you going to water so that you're getting enough water, but you're not creating erosion? What we did here was we pulled out all the old ivy and vinca and we planted introduced dwarf coyote bush which is the number one best erosion control for any hillside it grows in all types of soil it can actually get established with very little water or no water in the long term we do give this some water um, but it's in its very first stages it's only been in for less than a year so we're just getting it started right excellent well shall we continue on the tour yes Okay, Cassie, so we are at the very top point of garden number nine. I notice we have some broken concrete here and some wonderful ground covers. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, actually, the broken concrete is, is a wonderful find because we found it right from on site. There was a portion of the owner's driveway that uh, we needed to remove to accomplish some of her goals. And instead of actually disposing of that material, we were able to incorporate it in several places on the site. One was the split level uh, design that we have down below in the flatter area, and then a lot of stepping stone pavers that we've weaved ground cover through. We also have this gorgeous silver native ground cover, Lysingia silver carpet, and it's just striking against the, the green sedge that we have up here as well. Right, and uh, a wonderful use of your own resources, definitely, and it's permeable. I mean, you can grow things around it. Right. It lets the, the, the water run off in between the uh, pieces of stone there. Yeah, every actually everything in, on this site is permeable, and right. we don't have any runoff on this site. We actually guide all of our water to infiltration pits on this site, so nothing leaves the site. Right, and um, I noticed that the weather's a little different up here. <laughs> um, are we experiencing a microclimate? <laughs> this, is a, this is an extreme microclimate up here. We're at a, a, what I would call the peak of this yard and we have crosswinds that go from east to west, north to south, and every which way. And so you need to really thin your plant palette out in an area like this because you're going to have a lot of material that's just not going to be happy up here. Definitely. And then can you tell us a little bit about the foundational plants that you've selected with like this red bud yes. right behind us? Yeah, I love this red bud. This is um, a Circus, um, 
Circe's Occidentalis, and it has these beautiful little green dangling uh, leaves that are really beautiful and architectural. And then uh, when they lose their leaves in the wintertime, the very first thing you see around February is these amazing little pink flowers coming off of bare stems. So it's really striking, and it gives you something year-round. Excellent, and that, that's a key there too. When you're planting, think about the beauty that it provides all year round, rather than just such a narrow mm -hmm. point. Right. Like many of us do, and it's allowable from times. Thank you very much, Cassie. We'll continue our tour. Okay. <laughs> okay, Cassie, there's some science to this infiltration stuff we're talking about here. What, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about infiltration? Well, one of our biggest problems in an urban setting is runoff, and a we don't have necessarily the mind frame that water that enters our site is actually our responsibility to hold on to our site. Sure. And on hillsides, this is critical. This hillside, which we've climbed all over together, it actually drains towards the middle of the property. And traditionally, water is actually um, pumped off the property and sent into the stormwater system. But we've done something totally different here. We've actually taken all this water and we've created a drainage system where the drains all lead to infiltration. That's not water capture, that's actually just capturing water at, at that would be runoff and recharging the groundwater table and keeping it from carrying pollution into the ocean. And that is one of the most important things you can do and why California natives and drought tolerant landscaping is so important because it takes less water, which means less water being waste, healthier water quality. Right, so critical. Yeah. All right, so what are we looking at here? <laughs> well, um, you we, can't see it yet, but <laughs> that's right. Big we, this is up. all <laughs> underground, but it's very, very important. Right. And just so you know, this is one of our uh, infiltration pit covers. Okay. So this is about maybe a five foot deep hole by about four feet wide. And it basically is the second pit that we have. It's an overflow pit. So our first pit is over there and that captures the water from the driveway and from the slope and okay. from the rain gutters. Right. And when that overflows, it actually goes into the second pit. Okay. And then we have an overflow on this pit that actually takes the water to where it originally drained before the freeway was built. This used to be a natural uh, creek bed, seasonal creek bed. And so we've sort of restored that on this site and we're, we're really happy about that. Well, thank you for doing that. Absolutely. And uh, you're setting an example for all of us. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, we have such a great responsibility to think about these things and so often it goes overlooked. Thank you very much. And oh, one more thing. Yes. What do we got behind me? <laughs> oh, well, this is just super cool. We have this little wonderful bubbling fountain and it's solid granite and it's been reclaimed. It actually used to be a drinking fountain. So we've turned that into a recirculating water feature, which the birds love. And we actually have an amazing photo of a real local native red tailed hawk drinking from it. All right, thank you, Cassie. Yeah. Hey guys, we're at garden number 14 in Pasadena, California. And for those of you that have very limited space to work with, maybe just a patio, consider native plant gardening in containers. Hey guys, I'm with Debbie Loxton in garden number 14, right? Yes, garden 14. And I'm hearing incredible reaction from everybody that's walking in and out of here. Congratulations, uh, this is an amazing showpiece, definitely. Um, Debbie has over a third of an acre that she's transformed into many different areas, um, meeting areas, relaxation areas. Um, you have a really good grasp on that. Can you tell us a little bit about like this little area here could actually be done in a smaller space? Sure can. It's just, it's sort of like you take your space and you figure out what do you like, what would look good in it, and try to figure out in a lot of ways what makes you feel good in the space that you have and how to function in that space. And so if you go through this yard, you'll see little different areas that were intentionally made to be almost like small rooms or small enclaves in a larger piece. So to make the large piece look small and to make a small piece look large. Right. Two different ways. Excellent. Yeah, that's excellent. And it, it's almost like each space also has its own little personality. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a personality of you? or? <laughs> it's just sort of whatever comes to mind for yeah. the day. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on Urban Dirt. Thank you.
Debbie Loxon's garden, garden number 14 in Pasadena, California, definitely a highlight for me. And judging from all the wildlife, they like it too. No wonder it won Pasadena Beautiful's Golden Arrow Award. I'm so relaxed, I'm gonna have to take a nap. Thank you for watching Urban Dirt. We'll see you in the mud. Ah. Did you get it?